This is the EWN Radio Network. Welcome to On the Record with your host, Ashram Lux Lucis. On the record, I am your host, Astrum Lux Lucis, and today we have in the house Soledad Heron, and she is an absolutely amazing woman. She's just, she spans so many different things, um, from being a journalist to a TV producer. Uh, she was an attorney. Uh, she speaks several languages. Uh, she's a chef. She's just, you know, she's got so many hats, like I just can't even believe it. And so what fascinated me most about her was just all the stuff that she's doing uh, for the planet. She's got a show called Green Living, and um, she's helping to build a better planet. And so please welcome Soledad Heron. Hi. Well, um, thank you for having me. Glad to have you. So um, let's give us, you know, give us a brief little sort of interview, um, not interview, I'm um, sorry, give us your third second elevator pitch, and then we'll roll from there and see what happens. Oh, goodness. Well, right now I am, as you mentioned, I do produce the Green Living Show, and um, we've actually been trying, I've been trying to think of how long we've been on the air. I think we're going on five years now uh, in January, and um, so basically what we're trying to do is uh, spread the message about sustainability and, and being green and why it's good to do that. And we actually had launched a second show called Epoca Verde, which is in Spanish. And I produced that as well, along with uh, the help of students across across the nation to host the show each semester. So I'm, I'm really excited to be doing both of those things on Third Strike Radio. Awesome. Now, how did you get started with, you know, you started off as an attorney. How did you get started into film production or TV production? <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of funny because I actually heard once that the average person will have seven jobs. And, and by that, I don't mean seven employers. I mean seven different jobs in their lifetime. I think I've had way more than that at this point. But um, I used to work for uh, for an attorney, uh, sorry, a, a firm of attorneys, actually, a law firm in uh, in New York City. And it was a typical Wall Street firm, big, big firm with big, big clients, huge clients. And um, I actually worked in law for 10 years. And I should say just for for the record, since we're on the record, that I I did not take the bar. I'm not um, licensed in New York. Uh, And the reason for that, I actually was uh, going to law school at the same time that I was the law firm. And... Over time, I kind of realized something about the people we represented. Um, I, our specialty was corporate law, and also looking at what some of these people, I should, their, their corporations, our clients were all corporations. Um, of course, I guess under Citizens United, they're saying corporations are people. So, um, but I saw what they were doing and their activities, not just in the United States but throughout the world. And it bothered me tremendously, and uh, then 9-11 happened. And the firm where I worked didn't really do much to clean up the offices after 9-11. It was just this incredible pressure on get back to work, get back to work. We were told to go back to work a couple days after it happened, actually. And uh, I just remember the stench in the air. It just smelled like hair burning it just burning hair yeah. with the smell, and and it was a, a real surreal, almost a surreal kind of feeling because it was the first time that New York City was silent. I mean, it was absolutely you mm-hmm. could hear a pin drop. It was so quiet, and the just the visuals was like being in a, a scene at a Schindler's List because everything was covered in ash, and it was slippery to walk on the sidewalks because there was like an inch of ash everywhere. Okay. And yet they're telling us, go back to work, go back to work, go back to work. And <laughs> and and just, you know, you have the inner voice inside of yourself saying, something's not right here. Or, you know, why are you, you know, something's not right. And anyway, so th- there's a firm where I work. We work some crazy hours, you know, 80, 100 hours a week. 
And I think just being in that environment, the negativity and breathing in all these toxins and, and the ash, which was full of who knows what, all kinds of toxins, it, it really took a toll on my health. And then the problem was uh, also there was there's a psychological issue as well that I started seeing or almost predicting some of the events that happened over the last decade because some of the clients we represented were the people orchestrating these events, right? And so something in 2004, I actually took a remarkable trip to China and just being away and having that time to kind of think about things. But I I always tell people there were two trips that I've taken in my life that, well, I should say three, that really were kind of eye-openers to me. And in basically in, in realizing how much we're lied to, particularly by the media and the folks that run it and the people that are part of it. And that was a trip to Bosnia I took in 1999 and then the trip I took to China in 2004 because, you know, we grew up being told, oh, you know, everybody's starving there, you know, don't be sure and eat all your food, there are people starving in China. And <laughs> that's not what I saw when I was there. And even their concept of of communism was not what I expected because I was greeted by this 60 foot billboard for Gurlane and Motorola. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, wow, Chairman Mao must be turning over in his grave. But, you know, there were, I, there were um, religious uh, centers. You know, I went to, there was a Catholic church that had mass every morning across from my hotel in China. There was, I went to the uh, Buddhist lamasery uh, that was having regular services as well. And I'm like, well, that's not what I was told. You know, that it's what I saw was not what matched with what I saw. And the same thing when I went to Bosnia. At that time, we were seeing all these images of war on CNN. And when I got there, I actually saw these beautiful homes that had literally a Mercedes in every driveway. They had uh, orchards with cherries and figs. And I'm like, where's the war? <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and, and the people there said, oh, that ended a couple years ago. And I'm like, the war's been over for two years? So what is it? You know, I'm like, oh, my gosh. So it made me question how much can I trust what's on TV? Yeah. And the flip side of that was a trip I took in. Uh, I was actually part of a um, documentary about wine. And I went to the Republic of Georgia, and that was an incredible eye-opening experience on the other side. And it made me realize how you can really control a population because, uh. they, you know, the, the people that live there have very little knowledge of the outside world at all. They, they only have a few TV stations, and, you know, what's being shown is, is pure propaganda. And, I mean, to, to the point that, you know, I, I actually spoke to people who still thought that Condoleezza Rice was Secretary of State in 2010. And I'm uh. like, no, no, she's not. <laughs> but also kind of, and, and then I realized it's kind of what you see here in the United States, this kind of sense of, well, we're it. We're all that matters. You know, we're everybody you know, wants to be like us. And cause the, I was hearing those same sentiments in Georgia, and I'm like, and just you know, kind of just an example that people would tell me, well, we're we're just like Europe, we're part of Europe, and I'm like, you're nothing like Western Europe <laughs> at, at all. I'm like, when you go to downtown Tbilisi, you, you're not going to get confused and think you're in London or Paris. And you know, and and one of the saddest things that really surprised me was that they would people would tell me, um. Oh well, you know we have lots of American tourists here. All the Americans love us. There are tons of American tourists, and what I saw were men dressed in fatigues carrying rifles and M16s. And I said, "Honey, those aren't tourists. They're soldiers. <laughs> if if they were tourists, they have cameras instead of guns." <laughs> and and it just really terrified me. I said, "Oh my gosh, they're believing what they're being wow. told." Yeah, but then I realized that's the same boat we're in. We're believing what we're being told. You know? right. Yeah, if you and, tell a lie long enough, it becomes a truth. Absolutely. And you know what I found? Yeah. Actually, I think I I don't want to misquote somebody, but I did read um, a quote that said, you know, what, what's harder for people to accept is that they've been lied to. It, it's much easier for them to swallow a lie than to swallow the realization that they've been lied to for years. You know, oh, what, there is no yeah. Easter Bunny? There's no Santa Claus? What do you mean? <laughs> right? And, you know, it's and, and that is really struck me. And I'm like, wow. 
And, you know, so so not to get too political, but those were t- trips that really were an eye-opener. So when I came back from China, uh, the first thing I did was quit my job. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was kind of like uh, taking that, that, that step off a cliff, you know, because I didn't have another job lined up. And, you know, I live in New York City, so I thought, well, what am I going to do? So I came back. I came back. I quit my job, and I didn't have anything else uh, lined up. So I was like, "Wow, I'm really flying through the air without a parachute here. What do I do?" So, uh, so my next uh, step was, "Okay, I need to find something." And I did try another couple legal jobs, and I said, "You know what? I just don't want to be a part of this anymore." And so then I went to work as a chef. <laughs> totally, wow. totally different career. And that took me to a few different uh, restaurants in, in Brooklyn and Manhattan, but one in particular was, uh, and again, another life changer, and that was a cafe called East West Cafe that had originally been part of the Himalaya Institute. And so they were very big on promoting yoga. They actually had an adjacent yoga studio, and they had um, they had a little cafe. And, you know, they had a lot of vegan and vegetarian options, but they also sold essential oils and things like that. And working at East West Cafe and looking at uh, and looking at um, the East essential oils and all the things they had there, and I started looking into the health benefits that some of these things had. And all this time, I was still suffering from um, you know, the different problems, health problems that I had from uh, 9/11, and. Um, so I started, you know, doing a little bit of research. We had a lot of books on the topic on healing with food and healing with essential oils and different nutritive type properties. And I said, uh, you know, let me let me kind of start looking at this. And one big problem I had was uh, with my skin. And I actually started looking at the different oils and was able to heal myself. You know, after going to doctor after doctor, getting no benefit whatsoever, <laughs> and they're just giving me all these prescription meds. And mm-hmm. and uh, you, the one that would give me the most for my skin was uh, cortisone, which is a steroid. And I said, I don't want to be mm. putting steroids on myself. Yeah. And what I found was with the different oils and using a lot of the omegas, it, the problems cleared up on their own. And mm. And it dawned on me, how come other people don't know about this? And I said, everybody should know about this. And so that kind of redirected, really, the course of my life from that point forward. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting because I always think that things happen for a reason and you meet certain people for a reason. So one day I got a phone call from a gentleman in Idaho, of all places, who wanted me to read a script. And I'm not even sure how exactly he got my information, how he got in touch with me, but he was developing a movie and when I read the script, I said, this is the worst thing I've ever read in my life. <laughs> and, I said, and I really hope you're not planning to invest in this project. It's just terrible. And so he said, well, how about I do a reality show? And I said, well, I guess everybody's doing that now. And he said, well, I want to do a show called Green Building. And because he actually was an architect by trade, so he wanted to do this building pro- show. And at the time, there were a whole bunch of other ones, you know, like the flippers and this old house. And I said, well, there's a lot of them already out there. And honestly, unless you're really into building, I don't know if if you're going to have the interest. I said, why don't we change it to green living? And that way we could talk about other things like food. And I insisted on food because of what I'd learned working at East West Cafe. And um, then I also insisted on music. I said, we should in every show with a musical act. And so to kind of <laughs> come a long way, or take the long way around here, that's how uh, we started including musical acts on every show. And I said, but the people I want to feature are independent artists who are who need to be heard. And, you know, so it's, it's been honestly the most rewarding thing I've done for, like I said, we've been going on five years now, and it's been amazing. Wow. Now, what is your actual role in the show? I produce it. Okay. And so then I uh I I get to um you know, figure out wh- who we're gonna interview, what guests we're gonna invite and, and we've had some just remarkable 
remarkable people, authors, designers, filmmakers, politicians. Yes, there's some good politicians out there. <laughs> um, we, we had a, a former basketball player on the show, just people who are doing amazing things that their stories aren't being told. That's that's the problem. Yeah. And are you part of a network? Where is the show airing at? Third Strike Radio, which is actually online. Uh, so okay. any so we're heard all over the world. Um, www.thirdstrikeradio.com. And, um, yeah, so it, we're heard everywhere. We actually have, I think at last... Uh, the last analytics we had, we had like 20 million listeners on six six continents, so everywhere but Antarctica, because those little penguins can't access the internet yet. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about um, how do you where do you upload the video? Do you host the video on your own server, like? So it's, you've kind of got your own online network, and so how are you putting the video content on there? Are you like hosting it through YouTube or one of those like Vimeo or something, and then sort of making it a private video over there, and then embedding it on your site? How is that working? Uh, Third Strike Radio right now is um, on that station. If you go to that link, ThirdStrikeRadio.com, dot com, it's radio only. And we okay. have our two talk shows, Green Living and Epoca Verde, which is like Green Living but in Spanish. And then we launch three music uh, stations, three music shows that air on Third Strike Radio, um, including Third Strike Rock, which you've been on, and uh, which is hosted by DJ Camera. And then we have a jazz show and a Spanish show. We also host uh, radio shows for other people. And among them, for instance, then there's a Drink of Ages, which is uh, based in Houston, which also features indie musicians in Texas. And, and beer, that's what it's called, Drink of Ages. <laughs> Talk about local <laughs> brews and local bands. And uh, the, the Middle Class Action Project, they have a radio show, and there's something, they're a project that I've just... I totally believe in because they're about bringing power and back to the working class, back to working Americans. And so they they have a talk show. Now, our video component right now is only for the music shows. So that would be okay. Third Struck Rock, which was our little spinoff project that DJ Camera Heads out of Austin. And uh, that, uh, you can see every one of her shows does have a video component, which you can see on Third Strike Radio on um on uh, YouTube. Okay. So the Green Living Show, because I know you sent me some videos, so I was yes. curious as to if it was an actual, like, television production type of thing that it you could see. It will be. <laughs> okay. It will be. Okay. We're in talks right now with a few different networks, yes. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I'm looking for a certain kind of woman, and I think you know her. She's an entrepreneur that is highly connected, successful, significant in her own industry, and considered the go-to woman in her community. She's received so much from so many women in business, she's ready to give back to others on their journey, lifting as she climbs. Hi, this is Sandra Yancey, and I'm the founder and CEO of eWomen Network. I'm looking to connect with the woman I've just described who lives in your community so that we might have a conversation about how eWomen Network's proven success system can provide her a platform to elevate her success and ability to support women in business. Our international community of managing directors are influencing the speed of success for women in business around the world. If that sounds like something that you want to be part of or know someone we should talk with, send an email to managingdirector at eWomenNetwork.com. That's managingdirector at eWomenNetwork.com. And let's start the conversation. Hi, this is Ashton Luxlusis, host of On the Record on the EWN Radio Network. We're aligning with North America's number one resource for connecting and promoting women in business, positively influence your business profile and success, does the idea of positioning your product or service as champion of an exceptional international online platform tailored to women in business sound lucrative? Do you want collaborations with high-caliber, like-minded, like-hearted women in business? 
on-the-record sponsorship opportunities will provide you with just that and more. Over half a million women business owners and corporate professionals connected, 1,500-plus women's business events yearly, and the largest four-day international conference produced annually. Over a quarter million monthly listeners are eager to learn about your business. Call Tammy Markham at 512-914-3952. That's 512-914-3952 to secure your sponsorship spots today. And we're back on the record. How do you go about approaching networks for the TV show? Uh, actually, through a, through an agent, because uh, okay. yeah, the, it's difficult. It's difficult, unfortunately, and I see I see this in every art, in music, in books, in in every art out there, in films. And that's the problem that all the major media has been bought out by a few companies. Basically, you've got six mm-hmm. major media companies in the world, and they control everything. So, unfortunately, yeah. they like to stick to formats. Mm-hmm. And what bothers me, actually, about the reality show format is how insidious it is. The reality show was created basically to not pay people. That that's the mm-hmm. entire reason for it, and, and 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 I don't mean to pick on people, but I kind of blame Friends. Remember the TV show Friends? I blame them because yeah. w- when that show went off the air, everybody on the show was making a million dollars or more per episode, and wow. I'm like, yeah, and that's when the network said, you know what, we're pulling the plug on this, and we're not going to have any more shows like Friends. And you know, just in contrast, uh-huh. when Mash was on the air, Alan Alda made two hundred thousand dollars an episode, but he wrote and directed all the later episodes of Mash. Yeah. You know, but but uh, and and not for nothing, but I think qualitatively there was a big difference between Mash that was dealing with some really serious issues, in a mm-hmm. book just had brilliant writing. But uh, anyway, but that's what you see now. The reality shows they don't have to pay. You know, they don't have to pay set designers because they're usually filmed in somebody's apartment. They're not paying uh they're not paying SAG member, you know, union actors. Yeah. And and what and what people don't understand when they look at something like the Kardashians, oh well they've made so much money. I'm like, Yeah, but they didn't make that as a re- quote unquote reality star. They're getting endorsements from products and, and things like that. And that's yeah. where their money's coming from, not from their pay for being on the show. Yeah. And because in actuality, most of these shows pay very little. We're talking, you know, a hundred bucks, a hundred to three hundred dollars a day, maybe, if they pay wow. anything, because the people on them are not union actors. You don't have mm-hmm. the protection of being in SAG or after, SAG after they merged. And you know, same thing. They're not paying union rates for writers. They're not paying uh, union union rates for anybody. And so what you end up with is, you know, I say you get what you pay for, a very poorly made product that doesn't have a whole lot of content. But unfortunately, it's it's kind of infiltrated um, down to every every aspect of of art and media. So when yeah. you try to pitch a show, they, they want to pigeonhole you into a different category. You know, oh, is this a talk show? Is this a reality show? And they're not willing to take a chance on a new idea at all. Yeah, and um, it, to me that's 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 really difficult. I mean, I ran I ran into the same problem with the book I wrote that I was trying to shop around. Um, unfortunately, around the same time that Sex and the City came out, and so people would say, "Oh, well, you're a woman, so therefore you need to write this chiclet genre." <laughs> and, and I said, "And I said, but that's not I mean, my you know that's not what my story is about. My story was actually about a legal case, you know, because uh, I mean, my favorite writers are people like John Grisham, so that was kind of my influence. And, and Brett Easton Ellis, he's another one of my favorite writers. And so I'm like, you know." <laughs> you know, why are you trying to put me into that category? But that's that's what they do. They box people in, and mm-hmm. so I found it very difficult. And and it was and actually it's interesting because some of the the leads I've had have come from the music connections because uh, actually the agent uh, that represents uh, the Green Living Show is a musician himself, based out of Houston. And he works with a number of, uh, uh, Paul Amer is his name. He's a great, great guy, has a bunch of different projects, and he works with a lot of other musicians in Texas. Um, and so it's really amazing. And the same thing with uh, with the, the book that I wrote. I met a, a lady that I had on the show, and she actually runs um, 
Sullivan Street Press. So it's, it's really cool, some of the people we've met. So you've got this vision here for this TV show, and you're hitting all the obstacles that, you know, it's me trying to get a record deal kind of thing. Like, you know, right. oh, you're... You know, you're not you're you're Mickey a chick Minaj. singer, but you're not a chick singer. You know, uh, right. we can't put you in this little this outfit, and you know, you're, you're old, and you're you know, it's so. What are some things that you're doing to kind of circumvent that? Yeah, I think the uh, way that people are going to have to go is just it. It's kind of interesting. I think we're kind of living in a an interesting time right now where right now these big corporations have all the control over all the media outlets, whether it's books or films or or music. But on the other hand, I do see an explosion of new, new channels opening. And, you know, for instance, for instance, I'll tell you that a lot of the new TV shows that I've seen that I've really liked have been on Hulu or Netflix, not on any major network, but rather through Hulu or Netflix. And, you know, I think what's going to happen is that, some of these, you know, some of these larger companies, if they don't change their attitude or their structure, they might find that they put themselves out of business. And what's really interesting in talking to a lot of the younger people that I have have had on the show, a lot of them don't even own the TV now. Like they're watching whatever they're watching online. Yeah. And and a, and a lot of it has been due to corporate greed. You know, they're saying, well, you know, I used to have cable, but then they started charging me this and charging me that. So, uh, you know, I decided to just watch everything online. And I'm like, good for you. I'm good for you. <laughs> you know, I think people are saying, you know, I'm no longer going to be a prisoner to these big companies, you know. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so, so I think that it might just be trying to look through other channels and finding like-minded people who are also doing similar projects. And you build up that momentum. And you build up that demand, you know. Yeah. Is it possible to start your own television network and what would be involved with that? Is that like a big, huge process or? I do know of a um, network. I think they were actually bought out by somebody else, but it was originally called Varia and they were based um, here in New York city, but I think they filmed in uh, New Jersey and they they did get picked up. They were on a couple of uh, major cable. I don't know. I don't want to be misquoted, but I don't know if it was RCN or Comcast. But they were being carried by a major network, uh, by a major cable company, rather. And uh, they they were kind of interesting because they focused on lifestyle, but on promoting health and and um, different health topics. Um, so yes, it is certainly possible. The thing is finding the distribution. We'll be right back. Whether you are in business for yourself and you're a startup or you're a big company and you've been around for a while or if you're just an individual that needs a website, you have probably already learned it can be pretty crazy and stressful to make a website that meets the demands of today's consumer. From hard-to-use site builders to expensive web developer costs, here at For the King, our basic custom web design and hosting starts at just $37. You heard us right, a fully custom site for $37. Head to our website at www.fortheking.co. Once again, that's www.fortheking.co. And we're back on the record. What about things like um, YouTube channels, and I I think the other one is Vimeo, and uh, I know there's a couple others. do you think those are kind of viable platforms to maybe start the network and then as it grows in viewership approach, you know, it's kind of like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. That, that thing of, you know, if you're in a band and if you play out and Monday night at midnight and then you finally bring in some people Monday night at midnight and then they move you to Tuesday night at midnight and they move you on down the line until you're, you know, playing the weekends and then right. you, you've got your grassroots, and then the labels start looking at you, even though you That's were right. the same band Monday night at midnight. But now that you've got you know a hundred people following versus one, you know all of a sudden you're better. So it's right. kind of that right. mentality to play to these people who basically don't have vision because these people right. are in the very box. short-sighted. 
very yeah, short thing. Yeah. But that is how, uh, that's, and even though I'm not a fan, but that is how Justin Bieber got started, was he was, for yeah. some reason, apparently a sensation on YouTube, and <laughs> people were God following him. And, and it's, it's very <laughs> unfortunate, but all they look at is numbers. That's it. Yeah. And your numbers, that's it. The numbers are what speaks. Right. So, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't even want to get started on Justin Bieber. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we know Third Strike Rock is the home of the no Bieber guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, what other ventures do you have going? Are you looking at producing other TV shows or are you just we wanting are, to focus actually. on the um, and What do you got going on there? So our hope, just kind of timeline-wise, is that we'll have the the two sh- radio shows we have now, um, Green Living and Epoca Verde, converted into TV. Not converted because we're going to keep doing the radio just because there are certain things we can do, particularly on online radio that you can't do on TV. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we, there are certain things you can say. Um, so we're going to keep going with that platform, but also going to um, to uh, – we're trying to have both of those on the air by next year. And then we'd like to do some other programming more aimed at children because um, it's it to me it's you know, with, with what we do we're actually I should say that uh, Build a Better Planet which is the organization that kind of the umbrella organization that all these shows are under is a nonprofit and because of that we actually as I mentioned our Spanish show is actually done by students across the country and so we've you know gone and spoken at a number of universities. Um, I'm looking at possibly also working with high school students as well. But some of the, what I see really troubles me, you know, that we're really doing a tremendous disservice to children, but also to ourselves. Because, you know, when you and I are older, it's going to be the <laughs> younger genera- generation <laughs> supporting us. And, and it's, what terrifies me is is what people don't know and what they're not being taught. Yeah. And you know, and, and I can't, I won't even get into the entire education system how messed up it is. This oh god, this, this yeah. focus on tests and you know, and, and it's frustrating for everybody because I even speak to teachers who say, you know, I can't teach. You know, they're, they're, they're I'm being told to train them basically to take tests. But that doesn't create a thinker. That doesn't create mm-hmm. somebody who's capable of analytical thought. You right. know, it, 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 to me, it's terrifying, actually. And um, you know, it's in in the subject matters that we're not teaching. You know, it's it, we, we're losing a lot, I think. And you know, just as, as an example, something that I've uh, brought up um, when I was in school, they offered classes like shop and home ec, which we've now totally eliminated. And oh wow. It, you know, and 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 I said, well, you know, I'm great, I'm great that they're trying to teach kids coding and computers. That's fabulous. But on the other hand, I've spoken to adults who grew up in the system who don't even know how to boil water. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and I'm not saying everybody has to take a home ec class and turn into Betty Crocker housewife or you know you, you know make everything from scratch become Martha Stewart. But for you know, for goodness sakes, you should know how to cook a meal. And men and women, everybody should know how to cook a meal. I mean, you know, what good does it do you to know all this computer stuff if you're going to starve to death because you can't make yourself a sandwich, you know? And, and and the same is true with shop. You know, as a woman, I said, you know, every woman should know how to change a flat tire because what yeah. happens if you're driving on that road in the middle of nowhere where you're going to be damsel in distress waiting for your white knight to come fix your – and shining yeah. armor to come fix your flat? No, I'm going to yeah. get out the jack and fix it myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen way too many horror movies to know I shouldn't be waiting <laughs> on that dark, <laughs> deserted road. For you know? serial killer to come chop <laughs> you up, you know. <laughs> That's right. And it's – you know, and it kind of forms a state of helplessness and, and you know, just you – know, Kind of a kind of funny thing. I mean, when I when I did work at the law firm and I worked with a lot of brilliant attorneys who were, you know, Ivy League educated, brilliant legal minds, and yet they couldn't tie their own shoes or do like very <laughs> simple. So one of the funniest funniest ones was uh, I had a, a gentleman that was working in our Tokyo office, and that was at work. It was Monday morning in New York. And he calls up, didn't even bother to say hello or you know, introduce himself or anything, but he called up and he was screaming at me, I need this document by Monday morning, Monday morning, I have to have it Monday morning, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, 
do you mean Monday morning Tokyo time? He goes, yes. And I'm like, well, you realize it's Monday night there now. <laughs> and I just hear this <laughs> click. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of, uh, and that's, you know, along with education and a lot of what the reason that I really feel compelled to work with children and do a project that's kind of aimed at younger people is because well, there's a great line, um, uh, it was in the movie Powder, but I think it's actually been attributed to Einstein or other people that said, you know, our technology has surpassed our humanity. Mm, yeah. And I really see that when I see people, you know, I see a couple on a date, and each one of them is texting somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm sorry. To me, that would be a deal breaker right there because well, they could be texting sending... each other. <laughs> right. I, I think there was actually a commercial that had that had that that yeah. had a family. It was a mother and child texting yeah. each other. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. That's, that, I'm like, to me, that would be a deal breaker because the message you're saying is you're not important enough to deserve my full attention. Yeah. And I'll tell you, like, like when I go to eat with somebody, when I have dinner with somebody, I'm not, that phone is off and the phone is staying off because, yeah. you know, again, from our generation, when we had the old fashioned rotary phone, if somebody <laughs> called during dinner, you picked up and you said, I'm sorry, we're eating dinner right now. Call back later. Yeah. Or you just ignored it, you know. Or like, you ignored it, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 And oh my God. Yeah, I was in a a meeting with like a um, I think it was like manager of A and R at Atlantic Records, and the whole time, the girl and she was like half my age as well. I'm like, how did you get your job? Half my <laughs> age over there listening to my song and texting during the whole thing. I'm like, really? Are you kidding me? And I paid for this meeting. I'm like. Oh my God! I was like livid afterwards. Like, like I want my money back. I, you know, it was insane. I'm like, you should be fired first of all because if your company, if that's the way they operate, that's insane. And then of course it's the standard, you know, oh it's good production, but you know you should sound more like this and you should do more like this. And I'm like, why should? Why would you want another band? That sounds like another band. I, I just right, like I never right. got that whole mentality of, in the record industry. Like, we want to find more of this. Well, why? You've already got that, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was. I had a young lady. This was at a place I was managing that came in for an interview and pulled out her phone to start texting during an interview. Oh and my I god! And I said, "Well, you know, am I boring you? Because if <laughs> if this interview is boring you, we can end it right now. Don't worry, you're not getting the job." <laughs> I mean, but there's, we've lost all sense of decency, respect, manners, basic civility. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think on a grander scale, when we talk about we want to build a better planet, we want world peace, how can we have world peace with a country across the globe if we can't even treat our neighbors with basic respect? Yeah. Like, we don't even have basic courtesy towards anybody. <laughs> and it's yeah. it kind of the selfie. I couldn't believe this. I was actually watching this on TV last night. Uh, it was about the, there, you know, there have been a number of selfie deaths. More people have died from taking selfies this year than have died from <laughs> shark attacks. And I'm like, you've got what? to be like, kidding me. Real? This is like <laughs> a, a real, like, how did you die taking a selfie? <laughs> Apparently, the leading cause of selfie death is falls. I guess people are like, oh, look, let me take a picture of myself on this cliff. I'll take a step back. Oops. And and I'm just, and part of me is, you know, not to be very Darwinistic, but I'm like, good. You people need uh, to hey, take yourselves out of the gene pool. You were reading my mind. I was thinking natural selection at work right there. Oh, my gosh. But I've literally <laughs> seen people, like just in New York City, I call them the Oblivious because there was actually an article in the uh, Village Voice about the Oblivious that are so self-absorbed. You know, they'll be on their phone and they'll ta they'll stop in a revolving door in an intersection. I saw a woman stop <laughs> in the Broadway and 14th Street and the light is clearly changing. A whole fleet of taxis is about to run this woman over. But I guess there was some really important text she had to send. But then, what kind of cracks me up is when you actually hear the content about most of these conversations. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Are you going to date party? 
<laughs> yeah, and I'm going to get a pair of pants with the gap to wear to Jake's party. Oh, no, she didn't. But, you know, uh, like, and every other word is like, you know, every like. other word is like. <laughs> like, you know, like, for sure, like, you know, it's almost like the Valley Girls, but worse, you know. Yes, and it, well, it's, it's more pathetic because the people doing it weren't old enough to have seen the Valley Girls or Heather's right. or any of those films in the 80s. But for some reason, they have it in their head that it's cool. And yet these are young ladies, you know, and it's, it's very often it's young ladies. I've seen, heard some guys do it too. But they're going to, like here in New York, they're going to Columbia University or NYU. I'm like, oh, my goodness, now I'm saying it too. But <laughs> you're going to an Ivy League school, and yet you're diminishing the value of yourself as a person by acting as a complete airhead, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. And, and, and almost, you know, I feel so bad when I see some of, you know, to me as a woman, it really touches me when I see particularly young women, and I just want to embrace And that's actually, Astrid, what I love about your look. You're like, you, well, I think we're probably about, uh, I just had a birthday. I told everybody I'm 28 again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I'm very glad that I grew up when I did because I grew up with some kick but women who were great role models, you know, Chrissy Hine, Pat Benatar, those were my musical influences, women who were yeah. like, you know, Pat Benatar I think is my height and a lot thinner than I am. So I'm like, but yet she gave us such an air of like, I'm a cool chick and I could whoop your butt that you would leave her alone. She, she, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're like, yeah, she would mess you up. <laughs> but yet, you know, now it's like either the extreme of, well, you know, this extreme of, they've ex- confused sexuality with, promiscuity and mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm not getting into anybody's sexual habits it's up to you that's your own personal choice but it's how you come across you know when I, mean, I think of very strong women like Joan Crawford Betty Davis and you know Liz Taylor some of them had their own personal you know habits and you know dating habits whatever but they still came across as a very tough woman Mm-hmm. A very, you know, if Joan Crawford ended up uh, being on the board of Pepsi, you know, these were business women. These were thinking women, not women who came across as, hey, oh my gosh, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 it kind of to me undermines sexuality because as a woman, when I see a woman like Pat Benatar or, or Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders, and to me that is sexy, a woman who is right. so confident. Exactly. Like, yeah. Powerful, strong women who are yeah. are independent thinkers. They're not afraid to be themselves and not follow the crowd. Yeah, that's right. like way sexier than somebody who's scantily clad, shaking their booty and throwing their tits in your face. You know, it's like, absolutely. That's just me, kind of insulting. Right. You know, it's like that's what you. That's all you've got. Like that's wow. exactly like, the message you're saying. This is this is yeah. what I have to offer. My booty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and I'm like, that that to me is and, and you know, again when it goes when you come in and you look at role models, I'm like, who is it that people have as role models today, you know? I mean yeah. a woman who's only famous for making a sex tape, a woman who's only famous because <laughs> she put her butt on a magazine. <laughs> I'm like, that's not, you know, and then they're demanding to be taken seriously as celebrities. Right. So I'm, uh, I'm like, no, you're, and I think there was, you know, one of them wanted a, a star on the Walk of Fame. And I'm like, no, oh no, you do God. not deserve a star on the, you are not an actress. <laughs> you're not. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, you know, oh. so it's just, to me, it's, it's heartbreaking. And I kind of think we need someone to mentor these younger people and say, you don't have yeah. to do this. You don't mm-hmm. have to. You right. Know, they're, they're, you, you can look in and see the value of yourself as a person. You know, not, yeah. you know you're, you're more than just a booty to put on a magazine. <laughs> yeah. I remember hearing a story with Lita Ford and oh, uh, Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister. And Dee Snyder was telling her, you know, Lita, you are talented on your own. You don't need to do all this sex stuff on top of that. She's, right. She's like, just let that ride and and be, you know, who you are. You don't need to be pushing your boobs and your ass in everybody's face. You know, you're talented enough alone as it is. And, you know, that to me was like, you know, I guess sort of, you know, talking about going back, buying into the lie. It's like these girls are getting programmed through these reality shows. And this is how you're supposed to die. But like a real man, is Doesn't not going to want, want that. that. A real man wants somebody who can think. Like, I have a friend of mine who um, he's a, he works for, in Houston for some sound companies and does run sound mm-hmm. and stuff. 
and he he's an older guy and he used to date these really young girls and one day he was talking with a buddy at work and the guy's like so what are you guys talking about barbies <laughs> you know <laughs> right <laughs> and he like got it he's like yeah you know like really there's there's nothing there it's like dead air it's like oh you know what we can do today oh my god we can go do this and it's like how long can you tolerate that before you're like oh my god like shoot me like you know <laughs> Unless it's just so, ego, somebody who just you yeah, know, I, right. you know, I think of a certain presidential candidate right now running for office who always has the collection of Barbie wives. If you're yeah, so yeah. egotistical <laughs> that you just need somebody to be like, oh, you're so wonderful, <laughs> like yes, <laughs> she wants you for your your charm and personality, and I'm sure yeah. he's with her for her great wit, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and but like, you're right because you know I, I think of that. You know, as a woman, I wouldn't want to be with a guy who's only drawn to me for appearance. Because right. Yeah, because my appearance is, is not flattering. Fade. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's going to fade. <laughs> you get old. You get wrinkled. You get saggy. You know, it happens. It's unavoidable. And right. then what do you have? You know, you have divorce because he wants the the young twenty something. The, you know, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the next model. Yeah. The next model. The younger model. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Sandra Yancey, founder and CEO of eWomen Network. One of my mottos for business owners is, you can't do it alone. Whether you're in the startup stage of your business or you're scaling, you can't grow without relationships to provide support, wisdom, and new customers. eWomen Network is your home to connect with other women entrepreneurs who have been where you are or are experiencing the same challenges. We have chapters across the U.S. and Canada that have monthly events featuring our trademarked process called Accelerated Networking to ensure you get the contacts, resources, and leads you need to grow your business. And once you become a member, you get many benefits, including two one-on-one coaching sessions, unlimited access to our membership database, your own personal profile page, and discounts on products and services with our business partners, such as UPS and American Express Open. Join the eWomen Network community and let us help you live your dream. For details, visit eWomenNetwork.com. Do you like to travel? Would you like to travel more frequently? How about even having your own personal travel agent, including having 24-7 access to a very user-friendly website to book your travel as well? Look no further than Discount Travel Vacation. Robert Hernandez Jr. is a certified travel consultant and can help you with any of your travel needs. Anything from travel transportation by air, train, or car through well-known companies you have probably used at some time in your life. Also, pages and pages of hotels to choose from that you would normally stay at. The difference is in booking your travel with Discount Travel Vacation is the one-on-one care you get from having your own personal travel agent. It's the very engaging website to book your travel through. To the many discounts you will have access to. There are also lots of other travel options to choose from, such as vacation packages and cruises. Do not delay. Check out his site today, discounttravel.vacation.com. And we're back on the record. Did you have any mentors as you were beginning all this process? Probably my mom. And, uh, you know, it's it really bothers me that, you know, our, our society, and particularly you, you saw this a lot with the uh, family values. This was in the 1992 election when they were talking about family values, and they kind of try and vilify working mothers, which in today's economy, I don't know, you know, unless you happen to be married to a billionaire, <laughs> I don't know how you could not be a working mother in this economy, yeah. honestly. Yeah. I mean, I think most families now are two-income families by necessity because they have no mm-hmm. choice. I mean, you know, here in I live in New York City, the rent in the average studio apartment in Manhattan is now over $2,000 a month. I mean, wow. you know, if, if only one parent is working, all the money is going to to, to pay rent. And yeah. that's not even getting into things like, you know, health care and food. You know, you might want to eat every now and then, you know. Right. <laughs> um, but, um, and sadly, you know, and, and what bothers me is in terms of our society that we've become – this uber we're, we're like capitalism gone um, gone awry that even Adam Smith wouldn't recognize today that we think everything should have a, a price and a value and you know I had looked at some schools in in New York City and, and I'd looked at some private schools they're private schools and I'm talking like kindergarten 
that go for $48,000 a year. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, if you're paying $48,000 a year when your kid is in kindergarten, yeah. imagine paying that all the way through college. Jeez. And, you know, and, and you know, I mean, my personally still am paying student loans. I'll probably be paying them to the day I die. And But that's a tremendous disservice, again, to our young people. But I think of my mom, and my mom was a, um, a working mother. You know, she worked. And But to me, and it's very interesting because all of my girlfriends who had moms that worked ended up being very successful. You know, all the horror stories that you're told that your kid's going to, you know, become some kind of delinquent because, you know, you you weren't, that, that's all baloney. Every yeah. single friend of mine that I have who had a mom that worked became a very productive member of society, a very successful businesswoman in her own right. And because that's what you, you, kids do, what, you know, they, they copy what they see. Mm-hmm. And that was what I saw. I saw a woman who was amazing, able to work nine to five and then, you know, come home and, and take care of the home. But also what ended up happening is it also encouraged a lot of independence in mm-hmm. in the family, you know. So as you know, when once I got to be a little bit older, I mean, you know, we did have a you know, babysitters and stuff when we were really little, but when I got older, then I said, you know what, I, I can make dinner on my own. I think that's where my love affair with food started happening because I I found I really loved cooking and I loved Mm. experimenting and trying things. But I thought, you know, I don't have to wait for my my mom to come home from work to make dinner. I can make dinner, you know. (laughs) And, and, you know, so it kind of encouraged the sense of, you know, I I can do this. I don't need to wait to have this done. I I can do it myself. And, you know, and I think that ended up being the help for everybody because that way when my parents got home from work, you know, dinner was ready to be put on the table. And, you know, it was one less thing for them to worry about. But I think we need more of that. And I think if for some reason, I think a lot of parents now are afraid to, I almost I want to say they're coddling their kids too much, but they're oh afraid to give their kids. Don't even know. get me started on that. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I see a little kid, you know, roller skating, and he's got knee pads and elbow pads, and he's on a playground that's covered in rubber. I'm like, man, I fell down all the time and got hurt. Right? <laughs> and I'm proud of my scars. You know, I can tell people, yeah. oh, yeah, this, this scar, that's when I broke my arm, and this scar, that's what I did. You know, you you got it, you have to get hurt a little bit. And I actually, you know, since we're talking about entrepreneurship, I think that's actually part of the necessity is not only the successes but also the failures. I saw um, right. a great uh, – <laughs> as I was saying, when I left the law firm and you know, eventually started working as a chef, I took a huge pay cut. And um, just this past summer, we built a better planet. We got our 501c3, so we're now an official nonprofit. But before that, you know, we weren't really able to ask for cash donations because we weren't officially recognized by the IRS. So I said, okay, let's do things the right way. So basically, I was funding this project <laughs> and wow. living off nothing. But it actually, it was an experience that, and at the same time that I had, I had a lot of my stuff in the storage unit, a lot of my clothes and stuff were in a storage unit. And then I thought about the absurdity of that. Yes, I'm paying rent, but I'm also paying for a storage <laughs> unit. And there was a flood, and a lot of the stuff that I had was ruined. And uh-huh. But when it kind of made me realize what, what things I really missed, were my photographs that I'd taken, um, my writing, you know, I had stuff that I'd written, my pictures, that was a big thing. But as far as material things, I'm like, you know, clothes, big deal. Okay, well, I, you know, you, you, I think we've, it kind of made me realize what the difference between want and need mm, and yeah. what's really important. And admittedly, when I worked at the law firm, I was that, you know, character <laughs> and which I mean, the sex in the city came out afterwards and it made me really hate that show because <laughs> I think it was sending the wrong message to little girls. I'm like, yeah. your entire net worth should not be in shoes. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you know what, when, when times are really tough and you have to sell something, you know, <laughs> you're not going to get much, for, you're not going to get much for that, you know? And, yeah. and I, but, you know, then going back to like education and so forth, there really isn't a, a class. I mean, we took high school economics, but there really isn't a class that tells people, Hey, you should be saving money. 
And, you know, just as you were talking about the man going out to get the next model of younger trophy wife, this is the culture we live in now. You know, what, you ha- what you don't have the iPhone 6? Well, you need to go stand in line at 4 a.m. to go get the iPhone 6. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, and then next year it will be the iPhone 7. And, and what, you don't have this? I'm like, I, I, I will use the phone until it falls apart. I will wear a pair of shoes until they fall apart, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's not necessary to go out and get something, you know, every – I'm like, you're, don't you see you're being kind of played? I mean, how many of us come Black Friday coming up, going to be standing out there at 4 a.m. outside of Walmart, what, to buy towels? Oh, my God. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Buy bath towels. You're going to get into a fist fight over the last set of bath towels. And, <laughs> and something we're going to be doing, actually, you know, again, to, to kind of get back to entrepreneurship, um, something that we, we've been doing the last couple of holiday seasons is trying to encourage, we kind of encourage an alternative Black Friday. And Mm. the one thing I'll say is, you know, right now we're going into an election year, even though the circuit started a half a year early. So, you know, come election day, we're going to be sick of all these people. But they're talking about, (laughs) we're going to make America great again, and and I'm going to build a wall with Mexico. And and I'm like, yeah, you want to to create jobs in America? How about you support your neighbors? Buy from them. Right. You know, and, yeah. and so, you know, don't go out and buy from Walmart. Walmart doesn't need your money. Alice Walton's mm-hmm. very rich, thank you very much. Right. <laughs> you know, she's got a luxury penthouse here in Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> she and, and those people do not care about you. And I was actually thinking about that in terms of, you know, that we just saw the Steve Jobs movie that's coming out. And mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, I'm not saying he was a bad human being, but First of all, Steve Jobs didn't make your iPod. Those little children in China that are <laughs> working at the Foxconn factory, they had to install suicide nets because they can't even buy to get out of working there. Those are the kids that are making your iPod, okay? But, but then I thought, you oh know, my God. in terms of who we should be honoring, okay, what did Steve Jobs make? The iPhone, the iPad, the i this, the i that. Um, Jonas Salk invented penicillin. Isn't that? I mean, I was thinking, greater contribution to mankind. We need penicillin. You know, you will die if, in certain cases without that. Nobody's going to die because they don't have an iPhone. I'm sorry. But then yeah. I also think of somebody like Nikola Tesla, who invented a way for people to get free energy and made his pa- He died in bankruptcy. He died in poverty yeah. because he made his patents available to everybody. And you know who just did that was Elon Musk. And I love the Tesla car. It's awesome. It's totally green. And he just made his patents available to everybody. And I'm like, what a remark! That, to me, is a remarkable human being. Yeah. Saying, you know, what what matters is the greater good of of humanity. Nice, nice. You know, I could talk to you all day, Soledad. You are an amazing person. But we're running out of time, and I would like for you to share briefly um, some final words of wisdom. Oh, goodness. Um, you know what? I think it, probably the best thing somebody could do is to be true to themselves, find out who they are, and you know, and go with it, even in the face of people telling you to quit. Because that I've heard for the last 10 years since I left the firm, you know, oh, why don't you go back to doing that? No, you got to listen to that inner voice and go with what's good for you and what you believe in. And, you know, just make it happen. Try and make networks because um, in the end, the people who support you, you can build bridges together. But uh, just keep going because people will definitely try to deter you. They really will. They'll try to discourage you, but just keep moving ahead. Well, folks, that wraps up another episode of On the Record. Tune in next week. <laughs>